platforms, uh, et cetera, from going into effect. So uh, it's good news for everyone who's looking to file adjustment right now. Uh, in the Prior to this injunction, if you were to file for EAD and advanced parole along with your adjustment of status, there would have been a you know $1,000 extra in fees. Now that this rule is suspended, uh, we can go ahead and uh, proceed with the old fees, which were $1,225, and that would also include the EAD and advanced parole. So it's great news, and uh, hopefully it'll make the you know process for H1s, L1s, and other uh, non-immigrant classifications much easier as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes. Yeah, Lucas, actually, I think uh, first few minutes, the uh, audio is disabled. Just I'm repeating again what I asked to the Lucas. And once we started this platform to help to everyone, so you can utilize this one and uh, we will continue this platform every Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Central Time. So you can, we open conference call, you can call direct, direct and get connected to attorney. So you can directly ask to attorney. So I asked to Lucas, uh, give me the latest update uh, for this week. Is any changes from USCS and the, the immigration systems? So Lucas already is explained. Uh, it means so recently the District Court of California is, is asked, is, um, requested and uh, injection to stay uh, fee structure, new fee structure, which is going to be implemented from the October 2nd. So that is a very good news, good news to us. So Lucas, can you give me the rough uh, uh, fee structure? Uh, let's say, is a, can you give me the very elaborated fee structure for what is uh, what is a fee for I-140 and what is for advanced payroll uh, and uh, dependence? If, if we apply with the family um, and three members, sp husband, spouse, and kid, can you give me the elaborated how much they gonna pay to the USCS? Yes, so that's a good question to start off the program. Uh, going back, you know, I know people have budgeted for uh, these filing fees, uh, you know, so they can go ahead and, and start the process with the entire family. And I know a lot of people were struggling whether or not, you know, you're going to need EAD at the moment if you want to get advanced parole. Uh, so this makes that decision much easier because the fees are all included. So again, for each uh, um, person applying for adjustment of status, uh, the fee is one thousand two hundred and twenty-five dollars, and if you, which includes <coughs> advanced parole and employment authorization, if you want to downgrade from EB2 to EB3, and you qualify uh, to do so with your employer, the filing fees uh, remain the same. So they would have gone down to 555, but now they uh, are staying the same. And that's $700 for the I-140 filing. And you only need to file one for the principal uh, uh, applicant here uh, or beneficiary. And, and uh, again, like we discussed in the past, Premium processing is not in, uh, permitted for a downgrade if you're using an old uh, perm or labor. And uh, the reason for that is that, you know, the USCIS has to retrieve the original labor and uh, or request a duplicate from Department of Labor. And, uh, you know, this takes some time. So typically after you get the receipt, you're able to go ahead and then request premium processing. Uh, so it, that would be uh, an additional $1,440 if you did want to upgrade in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Here, I uh, just am um, uh, reminding, uh, I think in 2007 it happened, the USCS uh, make it as current all from still 2007. But in between the court is coming or maybe in between they stopped uh, Maybe one of the district uh, district state or uh, USCS came and uh, why these numbers given current. So 
I think USCIS is top to taking the files and uh, they want to return back. In between the court is come and uh, uh, said to the USCIS, you can process whoever applied in between time frame. Can you, it means, do you, uh, do you give me, it means I'm not in, uh, in the United States in 2007, just I heard about this one. Can you give the more information on that one? Because uh, the reset fee structure is involved by code. Is there any chance in future uh, it will happen the same way in 2007? Can you elaborate more information on this one? Uh, <clears throat> so it's probably, that was a, a unique, probably once in a lifetime type event. Uh, where you have people with pending I-140s without a visa available were able to go ahead and file for adjustment of status. Now, that doesn't mean the visa was available. It just meant that you could go ahead and file uh, at that time. Now, this, this what we just, just discussed with this injunction is completely different. Uh, has no relation whatsoever to anyone uh, being able to go ahead and file based on a priority date or, you know, whatever it might be similar to 2007. So um, I, I have had a lot of questions and comments where people ask me, you know, Lucas, why do I want to file for adjustment of status right now if my priority date is 2012 and I'm EB2? So I, I, you're asking me to downgrade to EB3 you're asking me to go ahead and pay the filing fees. You know, wh what's the benefit if I, if it's going to be years right now under the present uh, system before I get any uh, benefit for my green card? And uh, what we always discuss is, you know, what is the, the benefit would be uh, security, right? So whenever you file and uh, you downgrade, you make the decision, you still might be similar to the 2007 cases where it might be uh, pending for a few years, right? Uh, but what's going to happen in, in the meantime? Well, um, A, you have job portability. If your adjustment of status is pending for six months, um, uh, you're able to go ahead and transfer that and port that to a new employer however many times you, you need, as long as that employer is going to sponsor you for uh, the same or similar employment that you have under the original approved I-140. So that's number one. You don't have to worry about refiling the PERM or the I-140 or anything like that. Number two, you also have the opportunity to get uh, advanced parole and employment authorization. So uh, these two documents ca can allow you, which come in as one document now on a card, but the, you know, if you travel and you're not able to be stamped, well, similar to what happened with this pandemic, well, you might have a, an ability to travel back in the States, use advanced parole and come back in. Uh, also, if there's any denial of an H-1B in the future or some other issue with your non-immigrant visa, you're able to go ahead and uh, maybe work on that EAD. So, you know, a lot of people, as they stay here in the States, you know, they'll have <coughs> children houses, mortgages, uh, you know, your life here. And if it, we don't want any um, interrupt, interrupted uh, time here based upon something we can't control, which would be something like your H-1B being denied. So there's a lot of benefits. It's not, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, expect hopefully within the next six months or a year we get green card, but that's not always the, the case. Um, and then finally, I'll wrap up. Another point that I tell people is, is um, uh, I don't know if we all saw the TV last night, but you know, there was a debate, a debacle of a debate between the two presidential candidates. And we have uh, the possibility that, let's say, all the Democrats win uh, the Senate, the House, and then Biden wins the president. When the president comes to office uh, in January, the first 100 days is very key to their term on, on business they want to have completed. Uh, and so on top of that list, either number one or number two is going to be comprehensive immigration reform. So we have such a backlog right now, especially with uh, employment-based Indian nationals, that we're, you know, something has to be done. I, I just received an approved I-140 uh, this week for 
uh, someone, and, and unfortunately, their priority date, you know, is 2020. But if you did the timing of everything, you're looking at 75 years before the visa might be available. So action has to be taken. There has to be something done. And to sum up my point, if you already have your foot in the door or you have a placeholder and something dramatic were to happen within the next year, well, your application's already there and it's something that would process faster. So it's, that's a great way to be prepared and take advantage of a situation. That's, and that's the, the, the key point I'd like to just find, you know, end on before we go to our next subject is being prepared allows you uh, to take advantage of any changes in the law or visa allocations or anything like that in the future. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. Thanks uh, for very detailed information. So I understand, Lucas, from uh, H1 holder perspective, it means uh, there's still confused state. Let's say you mentioned as 2002 scenarios. Let's say uh, one H1 holder in EB2 priority date is uh, February 2012. Now he's uh, got confused whether I, I want to downgrade or not. If I downgrade, what is the issues? If not, what is the chances to get uh, to the 2012 February priority date in next couple of months or next one year. So do you have any inf additional information? Let's say he don't want to downgrade at the moment. He want to wait for maybe another one year or two years. Do you, do you have any information? It will move forward next couple of years till uh, 2012 March or something. No, so just like uh, as we discussed pretty much first here on this show, we <clears> anticipated <throat> there was going to be a large number of visas uh, reallocated from family-based to employment-based. And, and the main reason we've seen so much movement right now is because of COVID-19. It, it's a direct correlation. There's no other you know, work that's being done. There's no other lack of I-140s that were filed around this time or canceled or anything like that. The, this is 100% a direct result of COVID-19. Uh, you know, touch wood, hopefully, you know, we're seeing the end of this virus and we're able to recover. And as things come back to, to normal, you're going to see the regular process return. So um, to address this concern, what I've told my clients is it doesn't hurt to downgrade and uh, apply for adjustment if your priority date's like 2012. For EB2. So the final action dates, what you would want to pay attention to on that, uh, in that regard to see, you know, what tough decisions you have to make. So right now, obviously, the, the final action date is 2009, still August. And, uh, you know, that still could be years away before your final action date, which gives you the opportunity to have green card comes current. And um, again, like I said, I think there's a higher chance of someone having a filed adjustment of status based upon I-140 without a visa being available. I, I really firmly believe that if there is any, any immigration reform, that Congress can address that. Now, they can address it in two ways. They can address it by just changing the law uh, and, and the process of how we do this, or they could allocate you know, half a million visas to fix the problem. And so the moral of the story is if you already have your placeholder there, then if those visas are allocated and added, then, you know, it helps you speed through the process. There's no more, you know, you're already halfway there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for information. Lucas, uh, I have the two points uh, to discuss today. It means uh, these areas, uh, uh, most of the people got confused. They don't have the more information on that one. Uh, they are asking the more question about on these two topics. The first one is a concurrent process. Let's say if H1 holder have EB2, currently in EB2, he want to downgrade to EB3. So if he want to apply in concurrent process, how does the process work? It means, uh, as my understanding, uh, the both file uh, I-140 and 485 process the, in parallel are the first will process the I-140 once approved, then 
pick the file and start the process. Can you give me the more process on that one? So because yeah. most of the people is asking about if I apply this downgrader process, how 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 much time take to get the EAD card and AP AP card advanced payroll card? Well, that that's a good point. Um, I've had a lot of questions similar to that as well. So what? I mean, when we're talking concurrent filing, that means that we're able to file adjustment of status with our I-140 because the filing date is a, is allowed. Um, we have many other clients from other countries in the world, and uh, like in, uh, Bangladesh, for example, we filed many you know cases for Bengalis, but. It differs much from people from India because whenever we file the I-140 uh, for EB-2 or EB-3, we just file the adjustment status all at one time. Now, uh, of course, you're, once the case is received and you receive receipt notices, you know your I-140 can, uh, if it's in regular process, which in this case, if you downgrade it, will be initially, it, it'll start the process. And because you have a valid petition filed, the other uh, adjustment, and then also the um, uh, work authorization and advanced parole cases will also be processed. Now, it might take six or seven months to actually get your card in hand, but you'll still have biometrics and things like that to go to. Uh, the adjudication for the uh, actual adjustment won't take place until the final action date's uh, available, but you know, USCIS will make sure that the application is complete all the fees are correctly paid, uh, the, everything is there. So um, it's actually multiple files that we're filing at one time, uh, meaning concurrent, uh, but you're not going to get the same benefits all approved at one time. Okay. So even if uh, you know, you're going to be able to renew your EAD and advanced parole annually, uh, because uh, you have a pending adjustment of status. And if it takes you, you know, two or three years to actually get it to where your final action date is current, then you can renew it, you know, four or five times. Uh, and so these are all separate processes, but the processes that can get, that can occur all at the same time, hence concurrent. Okay. So yeah, it's a good information. Just, uh, I have uh couple of questions on this one that you mentioned is uh, we need to renewal every year. Let's say the final action date and the filling date is uh, two different dates in uh, Visa Bulletin. It means, uh, I never understanding the these two dates. So let's say we applied the 485 adjustment of status now, this October 2020 Bulletin. Uh, we assume that we, I, I, we got the EAD. So what is the situation? Uh, do we need, let's say, the after a couple of years, the final action date uh, got current. So do we need to apply again or the, the current process uh, in place directly we get the green card, maybe directly invited to for the interview? What is the steps for get the green card? Uh, green card? Uh, so, if I understand correctly, you're asking what are the steps actually apply for the adjustment of status until we get the green card, correct? Yes. It means my question, Lucas. Let's say currently in October, we subletted and we applied adjustment of status. I got the EAD. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, let's say, for example, my, <clears throat> my uh, priority date is uh, 2014 May. Okay. So, for final action date, I don't know whether it comes. It means it will take one year, two years, or three years, or maybe five years or six years, right? That during the this period, I need to continuously uh, renew the EAD card and uh, advance payroll. So let's say after five years, the USCIS current 2014 May. So at the time, I need to apply again. Are already my EAD in place? The USCIS uh, directly, maybe in process, USCIS will send an invitation to uh, interview, a green card interview, or what are the steps, the final steps? Here we have some uh, missing information. Just I want to, be, I want to clarify from you so that we we are clear the entire process to 
apply the 485 till get the green card so again the what we're discussing here on this topic today that's going to impact so many people is the filing date or adjustment of status okay that allows a person with a priority date on or before the date listed it for that visa category can file their adjustment of status to start the process. This will allow them to also apply for advanced parole and employment authorization. No further action will take place on the adjustment of status until the final action date becomes current. Once final action date becomes current, uh, obviously interviews will be scheduled. Uh, medicals will be uh, requested again because it's probably going to be a, you know, a few years and uh, the medicals will uh, have expired and you'll have to re redo them. Uh, so, you know, it, during that time, it's really up to you. I mean, I would recommend everyone also maintain their H-1B status just as a safeguard. But you have the uh, opportunity to work on EAD. You can travel with EAD. Um, you're not in a whole separate category. Um, you know, it's just kind of a placeholder until you're able to get your actual uh, green card itself. So, you know, you want, you want to renew annually uh, and keep that there, but, you know, by no means uh, is it required. So it's really up to you if what you want to do uh, and what works best for you. Um, but again, like I said, the, the GC itself isn't going to be issued until the final action date is current. I've, I've had people before where they've gone to interviews and before the final decision can be issued on, on that maybe the visa uh, availability is not there anymore maybe it's regressed uh, and to an earlier date so you know we, we like I said the most important thing is, is this is a similar to what I would say is like estate planning it's a, it's planning for your career it's giving you the opportunity to change employers after six months without having to refile the term without having to refile the I-140 this is giving you mobility, uh, backup plan in case you have to travel and you are not able to get stamped. So there, there's a lot of benefits to it where, hence, it's not necessarily just a green card, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation of giving more information. So now we can take a call from already ready to ask the question and conference call we can take a calls from them so sure. hello hello good evening uh, we can take a call maybe first uh, i can take from gauri the gauri if you want to ask question maybe you can ask as a uh, gauri is talking yeah. on mute uh, okay are you guys able to hear me yes yes Yes, you, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, Lucas, my question, my question is: uh, Let us say uh, today, uh, I'm in. I'm currently in EB2 uh, with prior, uh, with my priority date in Feb 2012. Okay. Now, so, uh, let us say if I downgrade to uh, EB3 and uh, apply my EAD, mm -hmm. and uh, let us say down the line, maybe uh, two three years down the line. EB2 date got current, uh, not EB3. But since I already downgraded to EB3 and I have EAD uh, in EB3, so uh, what will be the uh, action plan in that case? Uh, because EB2 date got current, uh, uh, you know, after two three uh, two three years. Correct. Do I need That's to upgrade? A... And uh, what is the process in that case? So what we would want to do. Mm -hmm. It's just as you can downgrade, you can upgrade, okay? So we would want to upgrade I-140, and then we would want to substitute the pending okay. uh, uh, I-140 with the pending adjustment of status and then notify USCIS uh, of this plan. So really, it, it's very common um, where people can do this. Now, you want to pay attention to the final action date because it doesn't benefit you to do this if it's just the uh, the filing date itself. So uh, if we get to the final action date and, and it's starting and, and the dates start moving or something like this, and we see EB2 uh, becoming more advantageous, definitely we can go ahead and, and uh, upgrade 
just as you have uh, are considering downgrading now to take advantage. Um, your priority date is also going to be your priority date, you know, until this is, matter is completed. Um, we, there's, we follow similar strategies also on the family-based side. So one could have uh, a priority date under one family member, and like a brother or sister of a U.S. citizen, and then take advantage of it with maybe their parent becoming uh, a U.S. citizen and petitioning for them. So uh, just as that, we're, we're able to grandfather on the family-based side, and you know, there's certain things we can do, changing categories also on the employment-based side to take advantage of this. And we need to have, uh, again, the 485 applied uh, as well, right? Though we have not the, uh, 485, uh, not necessarily? Not necessarily. So depending on uh, the circumstances, you can substitute the I-140, um, you know, with the, uh, uh, the pending adjustment of status application and notify USCIS that there's a new, uh, you know, category. Uh, that you'd be, you know, wanting to be considered under, which would be EB2. Okay, so we we don't need to go through the same process, EAD, and uh, 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 in, in that case, basically. Well, so EAD and advanced parole are byproducts. It's not the same thing as filing adjustment of status. You're able to request advanced parole and, and uh, employment authorization because you have a filed application for adjustment of status. Uh, they're not um, yeah, altogether I mean, no one thing. Uh, so it basically it's like uh, no different than if you have uh, H4 and then your spouse has I-140. Well, now you qualify to apply for EAD. It's just, it, it's a... Uh, it's not that there's anything special about having H4 to get the H4 EAD. It's just a certain category. Um, so H4 EAD is like a category C26 for employment authorization. Uh, and you're able to file for adjustment of status uh, employment authorization under category C9. And um, it's just something you're able to have while it's pending. So... There's no need to worry about refiling or redoing anything in regards to employment authorization or advanced parole. Okay. I think uh, maybe Gauri get more information. Maybe the Gauri, if you have any questions, maybe we, you can uh, reach out to the Lucas. Maybe you sent an email. If you have, apart from, if you want in, any information apart from this, you can send an email in for the radio to bgl law bgimm law dot com or you can reach out to Telugu another radio we can route to Lucas. Thanks, thank you, thanks for call, Gauri. Thank you. Uh, yeah, next we can take for the phone number last four digit is six three eight three. Maybe you can go for next call. Hey, hi, Lucas. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. How yes. are you doing? Hey, hi. Um, so, uh, so my question is more about like, you know, so I'm, so I was uh, with my employer, and then I'm, I've got a full time and then moved to B. So I'm in a good position and there is a good, very good uh, company that I'm working on right now. So I, my employer A called me if I wanted to downgrade and apply for my, you know, uh, like for 85, I need to go back to their payroll. Mm. So I haven't uh, replied back to him. I haven't given my decision to him yet. But uh, so I'm. I was looking. Uh, I was kind of browsing to see if there is a possibility I can do a concurrent H one B. Very so good whereas question. I, whereas I can work at my. I'm very sorry. good question. Yeah, very good question. I had this come up the other day where uh, candidate, you know. Uh, has I-140 with previous employer. Uh, this person I, I spoke yeah. to has a perm in process right now, but it's still going to be a few months out. So he might miss. The, the same uh, thing, same situation. Yeah. Yeah, so it's very common. Uh, I Actually, what I suggested, because some of, some of the consulting companies, they say, hey, I have I-140. If you want me to do a downgrade, you need to come back. Uh, and if yeah. most people might, might be full-time, 
and they might have to make a decision, hey, I'm going to have to go back or whatever. But yes, I, I made the suggestion, why not just do a concurrent H-1B filing if you want to be on payroll? Now, there are benefits to being on payroll when you're doing the I-140 where you can show the ability to pay the proffered wage. Okay, uh, If the company has enough yeah. profit or assets, you don't actually have to be uh, on their payroll to file. But again, it, there's nothing you can do to force force this because uh, at the end of the day, you're you're the, the petitioner or the employer has to sign the form, so you kind of you know have to go along with it. If that, if they want you to work for them to sign, then you know that's a trade off you might have to make. Yeah. So in my case, also it's the same thing. My employer be already already filed my form and it's in process. So by by I'm expecting by January I'll probably hear something back on that mm. uh, uh, decision. But in the meanwhile, what I'm thinking is, if, uh, so if if I wanted to take advantage advantage of this October filing dates, uh, the only way I can do is through concurrent H1B. So I, w one of my other question is. Uh, some people told me like I can only work for 40 hours on H1B. Uh, so if I have a concurrent H1B, so let's say uh, my employer has accepted for concurrent filing of H1B. So can I work for 40 hours over there and 40 hours over here, or I need to uh, work only 20 hours here or 20 hours there, something like that? No, no. So you can have your normal H1B. That's not a problem. Okay. Uh, concurrent filings typically mm -hmm. limited to part time, so you'd be limited to maybe 30 hours, 28, 30 hours a week concurrently okay okay so, so if you do means concurrent... I can work for like 70 hours if i find that sound correctly correct so if you do concurrent okay, and that, you had, that yeah. yeah if you do concurrent it has to be like uh uh it, it's like a part-time you're not the way the regulations are set up you can't do like a full uh full-time employment but you know, but there, there are ways around this. So, um, yeah, yeah. One second. So what is your name and uh, what is the priority date for your current process? Uh, 2013 January. Okay. You see, so what I would recommend, yeah, uh, I would look at short term, right? So I'm sorry. if this is <clears throat> what I would recommend is looking at the short term, uh, EB2 Jan. 13, um, it, you know, is still going to be quite a ways off if, if nothing changes. So if you're able to go make it a, a, a decision to um, file and downgrade, maybe you're, hopefully your employer is not listening to the show right now, but you're only required, uh, <laughs> you know, after, after six months, you can make whatever decision you want because your employer can't withdraw your I-140, right? <clears throat> Uh, after it's approved so yeah. if you if you get it approved uh wait six months and if you want to move back or you do whatever else you need to do you can go ahead and you're free to do that and then your new your employer b if you decide to say you can tell them like look i'm going to go ahead and file here and we'll just do the porting later after the six months of the adjustments pending uh, and then you know the only downside would be is if you wanted to maneuver back to eb2 you know, if the dates move like what we were speaking about earlier, you'd probably want employer B maybe to file if they've maybe they've already invested enough to where it's easy to just go ahead and file the EB2. But there's a lot of options, you know, uh, on something like that. Just don't miss the opportunity if you if you can't help it because uh, November is probably going to see a drastic change in the the filing dates. Okay, is positive or negative? So are you expecting uh, negative a retrograde? A retrograde? <laughs> uh, I would expect it's going to move. Yes, there's a lot of people that are going to be moving from EB two to EB three. If it's not in November, then definitely no December is going to change quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. What is your name? Is a what, what is your name? Jyoti. Jyoti. Okay. Jyoti. So actually, this is a this. Yeah, this is a very valid question. Edmund. So most of the H1 holders um, fall into the, the situation whether they need to utilize this yeah. uh, October visa bulletin or not. The being with uh, a current employer and previous employer, this is a lot of confusion. You, you, this, this is a very good question. And uh, I think I hope you got the valid information from 
Lucas, maybe you can think and you can discuss with your previous employer and uh, if he supported, maybe you can make a step. I think. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I don't want to extend my question, but like I already had this conversation with my employer, and he's very uh, adamant about me uh, moving back to his uh, to his payroll because he wanted to show the ability to pay plus. Yes, this is uh, up to you and your. Uh, this is up to you. The uh, one second. Hello. This is up to you and uh, your hello. employer. Yeah. One second. Hello. I will take a call. One second. So it means this is. Uh, hello. Uh, so uh, I, I think, think uh, my name is Pradeep and I have a question. So my phone number ends with seven seven two six. If you can call me out when you're ready, that would be great. Yeah, Pradeep, I, I will call one by one. I have the list who, who joined the call. I am calling out the by phone number and names. If yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm it means uh, as by my experience, so it as I no, give me a second. It means just I want to clarify with you. One second. So as I said, is uh, it means I'm been seeing this uh, cases last couple of weeks. Better to it is the uh, understanding between your employer you uh, if. Your employer is uh, ready to help. Maybe why don't you take your opportunity? So thank you, thank yeah, you very sure. much. But like Paul. my yeah 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 yeah. I don't want yeah, to we, yeah. yeah, we have a lot of calls. Maybe we need events. We are trying to give the all information. Just limit your questions. Better to everyone get a chance to ask to Lucas. Yeah, thank you. So Hello, next Mr. one is a. Uh, yeah, next one is uh, I'm going for last four digit nine zero seven five. You you can ask a question. Hello. Uh, nine nine zero seven five. Last four digit. Okay. okay, so we can go for next call seven seven two six. Maybe, yeah. I don't see name. Yeah, seven seven two. Yeah, my name is Pradeep. I'm calling from Illinois. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask my question. So I'm in a, I'm in a uh, tricky situation right now. So so here is what happened. I was with Company A, and I have a valid I one forty from Company A uh, on EB two uh, for um, uh, May of two thousand thirteen. And then I moved to company B, and I also got a different I-140 there uh, for EB2 again with the same priority date. But now I'm, I came back to company A, okay? So, but now it's a, the company is different. They, it, it has become bigger. So the, the earlier I-140 have, the name of the company is different. Now it's a bigger company due to M&A activity. So now my question is, uh, since I'm with the same company as before, and I have an IM40 approved on EB2, uh, but I'm in a different position. So in my case, what would be the best thing to do? Like, is there a possibility that they can still file for the next stage by downgrading, or do I need to go through the entire firm process again? So that's a good question. There's a, a certain memorandum that allows you to uh, continue with the same petitioner as long as there isn't substantive change with it. So the companies all the time merge, sell, change ownership, uh, identity. If you could show certain documents like sale or purchase forms, merger forms, certain documents filed with the Secretary of State for where the company is registered, you can uh, follow that uh, process and, and use the old I-140 now. Whenever a lot of people also need to remember, whenever you're you're speaking about current employment, such as uh, I'm software developer now doing DevOps, you know, here. But previously I was a programmer analyst, you know, doing Java work or .NET. Um, it's kind of it's substantially different, um, you know. As long as the job offer still exists for what the I-140 was uh, approved for, and the, the employer um, obviously uh, signs off on this, and the job offer is still there, you can use that. So you don't, 
it's the same as if you're not even working for the company right now. If you were working for company A and you and company B might have had the opportunity for you to downgrade and they're going to file your I-140 again and you can file adjustment. I mean, you don't have to actually be working for company B. You know, you just want to make sure that the issue of ability to pay doesn't come up whenever your I-140 is being processed. Okay. Okay, got it. So yeah. basically, uh, yeah, thank you for your answer. Uh, I think for me, there's not many options to go back to company B now, but for company A, I already have a own party, but that was for a different position. I was a software engineer before, now I'm a system engineer. So, uh -huh. but still they can go ahead and file the next day saying that they still want me to, you know, uh, fulfill that position, right? And what will happen sure. once I... Uh, assuming they'll file and I get the approval for a green card. Once the green card arrives, do I need to go back to that same position which they had applied for? Well, that's a good question. I mean, in good faith, you're supposed to, yes. But um, some people, okay. unfortunately, I mean, I, I've seen it before where people get the GC in hand and they abruptly leave the employer, okay? There's no requirement okay. uh, by immigration to that okay. you have to actually work. I mean, that, that would... That's sort of a indentured servitude where we don't want people to have to be, yeah. quote unquote, uh, tied to their employer. So the only issue would come up is when you're applying yeah. for a citizenship, they might ask you, you know, why didn't you work for this person who petitioned for you? You know, that that's where that issue might come up. Okay, but uh, so in that case. Uh, they file for the next stage for the previous position, but in my current position, I still continue in the same position. That should not be an issue because I'll be still employed in the same company doing, I mean, pretty much similar job, you know, in the same, uh, you know, you can, things like that. So that uh, again, should not like, be an issue, right? It should be an issue. And again, as long as your employer doesn't withdraw your pen, your, your I-140 within the six months of, after it's approved, I mean, you can okay. get your I-140 filed and then, like, literally, like, tomorrow you can quit Company A and go to Company C and, and still port okay. over your uh, your I-140 after, after the adjustment's been pending for six months. So there's a lot of uh, oh. benefit for you. The, the, the law AC-21 was created to help people not be stuck for the same, in the same circumstance with the same employer. We don't want you to have to be tied to the same person if you don't want to be, you see. Yeah, I think okay. uh, Pradeep, you thank brought you so the information. Your, yeah, thank, thank you, Pradeep. Thank you, thank, thank you, you very much. So next we go for last, what is it, 9075? Maybe you rejoin, maybe you can ask your question. Hello. Hi. Yes, your name and uh, you can start your question. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. May I go a question? Go on. Yes. What, what's your name? Yeah, my name is Raj. Okay. Uh, I have a 140. Uh, like, uh, if I uh, downgrading, what are the, like, documents uh, needed? The same thing, like, uh, when we apply uh, first time or different documents, like, uh, when you are downgrading? Um, the basic case, uh, like uh, the employ uh, <clears throat> employment, uh, all the previous employment documents, is it needed? Uh, like, uh, which is we file at the time of uh, first time, uh, mm, first filing. Can we use those? Good question. Yes, you can use those. Now, remember, uh, your previous employment is going to be listed on the labor itself, and that's you know some of those supporting documents are what you use. So. Uh, in all essence, if you have, still have the same uh, letters, go ahead and use those. Now, the petitioner is probably going to, your employer is going to update their letter of support. Uh, and obviously, when they refile the I-140, you're going to have to, you know, request a different category and things like that. So, um, uh, is, I, it's perfectly so, I mean, fine. To, is it the Sorry, Go ahead. Is it the same document, uh, which, is, which is the like experience letters, uh, which was used earlier, can be used or uh, just we need to request again? You can use the same. Uh, you, you, same education. If you had any type of education evaluation, you could use the same. Uh, it's perfectly fine. 
any type of uh, certs that you have, you can reuse it. it and uh, the only thing you're going to have to get fresh uh, this time is going to be the uh, letter of support from the current employer when they file the I-140. They want to update that, right? Okay, thank you. And one more question on the EAD. EAD is uh, like, uh, is it for uh, the uh, the um, amount for, is it for two years or three years for renewal? Uh, it's going to be one-year renewals. Oh, one-year renewal. What is the fees for that? For so that at the beginning of the show, uh, we had, uh, you know, breaking news from yesterday. There was a court in the Northern District of California has uh, issued an injunction against the new proposed rule with the fee increases and the new forms for the I-129, everything. So we're going to stick with the old rule or the old fees, uh, which is $1,225 for the adjustment of status, and that includes filing for advanced parole and EAD. So the, right now there's no additional fee for the initial filing. Lucas, his question okay. is for, for if you get the EAD, what is the price for every year that you move? Is around 390 uh, or 400, 410 four, or something? It's 410 right now. 410, okay. 410 for yeah. a person? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. If you, if, if in a family, four members, four members and EAD, if you want to renewal, you need to apply. 410 into 4. Okay. <laughs> yeah, one more question is like the H1B is uh, like uh, as for uh, uh, law, just like, you know, uh, we cannot be uh, out uh, job on in one month. If we get EAD, is it the same rule applies or is different rule? Different rule. So you'll want to... Um, <clears throat> maintain your non-immigrant status, okay? Now, when you're filing um, for employment base, you know, if you're out of status, there's a waiver if you fall out of status for, for up to six months. So 179 days, if there's any issue where you fall out of status or anything else, it's not a major problem. There's a waiver that once you go beyond 180 days of being out of status, then uh, there's an issue where you uh, uh, would not qualify for that waiver, okay? Yeah. Thanks, Vito. Uh, maybe, yeah, sorry, uh, maybe yeah. I misunderstand, uh, uh, mis uh, play the question. The question is like, is it on the EAD, is that not, uh, the rule is not worth, like, I mean? I can't, I can't hear that well. What, say again? Uh, the EAD, the H1, e, H1, just we cannot be more than one month uh, out of the work. Like, is that EAD also same thing or different? Uh, like, it, it's, mm. uh, it's, that rule is not. So, that's the part. So, H1, um, whatever you No, saying, I think, uh, uh, Lucas, 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 I understand his question. It means, so, let's say current he is in H1 holder. In maybe after six months, he will get the EAD. He is asking about asking in H one. Maybe we we have a option I to see. out of hundred days or something. Maybe 30, 30 days or sixty days. The same rule applies for when when he get the EAD. So I no. think maybe as for my knowledge, EAD is a you are free to free free to uh, anywhere. I think I don't I don't I think this this rule. Right. Is not fall into the EAD. Correct. I think uh, I misunderstood. I thought you were asking about maintaining your H one while also having EAD. So two di two different things. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Vira. Yeah. I mean, so you you asked a lot of questions. Thank you. Just a uh, lot of people are waiting for asking question. Thanks for yeah, sure. Thank call. You. But you can connect every week every week uh, Wednesday if you have any questions. Today we take the specific topic. Maybe in, in future, we categorize the topic-wise. If you fall into the, the topic, maybe you can call and uh, get clarified. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we can go for Adlapalli Srin. Srini or some Srini. The last four is at 1089. You can go for ask if you have any question. Hey, 
this is rajendra actually my phone number distilled differently but yeah uh, okay so thanks, oh, thanks rajendra yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, sorry if i'm asking the same question if it is already answered uh, my question over here is like i am in eb2 category which my dates are current say in future like my filling action or my final action moved the uh, eb3 so whether i can downgrade it to eb3 after filing after my ead is approved i missed part of the question on a connection issue can you repeat sorry like right now my i am in eb2 category and my filling actions are current so now i am filing my 485 mm-hmm. right so once i get my uh, eld approved and everything right in near future if the final action for eb2 move ahead and eb2 is never never coming back for final action in order to get my green card is there any way that i can downgrade my uh, current uh, 140 to eb3 again Of course. I mean, you can you can uh as long as the the circumstances remain the same on, you know, the qualifications to downgrade, you you're more than welcome to uh utilize that downgrade and uh, uh update your adjustment of status to to use that new uh visa category so you can u- utilize the final action date, okay? All right. Okay. So that's 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 question Hi. number 1. Hi. yeah and sorry for that like one more question i have to during this period of uh, getting approval process right if there is uh, what will be the impact if i travel outside the us well so when you say travel outside the us are you saying a brief trip abroad I mean, like i have some some yeah i yeah i'm i'm uh, in this process of i have i have filed my 485 right now and i have some emergency or some requirement i have to go back go to india and come back like, right right this, how what would be the impact yeah well you would want to wait till you have your um advanced parole ead in hand if you have that in hand obviously it's it, you know that's what it's there for for you to use now obviously something sometimes things come up uh it might have an impact on your case if you like let's say file tomorrow your adjustment of status and then let's say by mid december you have an emergency and you have to travel home you know that could cause an impact mm-hmm. on your case because you technically uh you know we don't want to have something where and obviously if you're on H1B stamp can you get stamped come back in is there any issue with that uh if you're away for a certain period of time is there going to be an abandonment uh to your case you see what i mean so there's certain circumstances that could impact it now the best course of action would be to have advanced parole EAD in your hand uh before you depart the united states thank you look that's all okay. i have Thanks for that. Most welcome. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Rajendra. Thanks for calling. So next we can go for Devinani Lakshmi. Last four is a two four nine three. Thank you, Lee. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, Lucas. My name is Lakshmi. Hi, Thank Lakshmi. you so much for uh, all the all the answers. It's really really useful and uh, different different uh, questions I am hearing uh, in this forum today. i've been attending so many um, you know calls every day but this sessions are this session particularly everybody is asking lot of different questions which are really useful yes yeah, thank you questions. so much and thank you anare uh, radio for uh, bringing mr yeah. uh, lucas here yeah thank so, you thank um, you very much i have one particular i have one particular question for me and after that i want you to answer two of the questions uh, what uh, the people are asking on facebook i'll tell you in general it will be useful for everybody so sure. one thing my personal like in my question is uh, while filling the 485j uh, there is a section there where we have to fill in the candidates i think somebody asked this but it was not really <coughs> clear so my question is here um, they're asking for the soc code and the title and also the job description and also the salary is that what we have to uh, mention what it is there in the form if the employee is currently working for the same company and say Correct. for example a uh, company we applied somebody in 2011 in 2011 and applied as a senior program analyst and right now he is with our company only and with his h1 and after like 3 4 years uh, he has been uh, 
promoted as uh, integration engineer or integration application developer uh, which the soc code changed but the similar uh, and uh, higher position so which thing i have so to uh, mention in the i485j so the i45j is directly referencing what was listed and filed on the labor sort of the ETA 9089 that was filed with the i140 okay that's for that job offer not whatever h1b status that person's in and not any other job title okay so it directly references oh. the um whatever was listed on the uh, that labor sort of the ETA 9089 labor certification right so what you want to do is reference that, and obviously, if you need a, the help of an attorney, you might want to you know seek out the assistance. But um, it's very important, and I'm going to say this to be very clear: like the dates can change uh, month to month on, on the visa bulletin drastically. You don't want to submit um, an adjustment of status. And have it pinned or have it mailed out, and then to, to have it rejected or sent back six weeks from now, and the November bulletin, uh, you know, moves, and you're no longer able to file on that priority date. So it's very important to make sure you have everything correct and all the information listed correctly, and matching everything else. Exactly. That is the reason uh, I'm just trying to check. I'm trying to send it to my attorney all the papers, but you know, just want to make sure what exactly we need to put in there. Also. Sure. Because sure. all the attorneys are very busy. They're asking us to fill in the forms and send also. And then another question that I have in general, somebody asked on the Facebook and uh, I think some Santosh. Uh, it's related to 944. I'll ask mm -hmm. both the questions and you can answer, okay? Um, sure. The 944 form, he's asking like the assets validation, uh, we have to contact the CPA and get it done. And, you know, also the um, inspection for the house and all those details in the 944. Uh, it's a really confusing um, form. So, but that yes. also, I just want to make sure uh, anything that we can then, in general, you can explain that. So you want to list in general estimations, you know, what the value of the property is what the mortgage is uh we have a term called underwater you know is, is the house worth one hundred and fifteen thousand and you owe three hundred thousand right that's underwater but it doesn't mean you have to actually have an official house inspection or estimator to come out and do this you have to pull your credit report uh re and put your credit score on on the form you need to list um, you know, your assets. So if you have savings account that has X number of dollars, all you do is you list the uh, X number of dollars, the source savings account, checking account, X number of dollars. You know, uh, it's not like it's a uh, hard and fast exact asset, uh, you know, picture of all your assets. It's just the, the form is there. I don't agree with the form. I think it's an overstep of what the policy and the regs are supposed to show. And require um, there's still litigation going on to even if this is even permissible and uh, the most of the questions if you notice some of the questions relate to are did you re uh, uh, receive any of these uh, uh, assets or any money from illegal gambling or, or you know illegal activities uh, you know have you used uh, any public yes. benefits those are the main questions that come up so not yes, just, yes you know don't don't worry too much about you know is my house worth 350 or 375 don't worry so much about that yeah oh, okay. thank you thank you, so thank you the third question is uh yeah, thank thanks third for question is the intra filing thank you thank you so much and the intra filing you know everybody is worried you know everyone wants to downgrade and go to that and uh, all the attorneys are saying that you can do an intra filing later so uh, exactly what what is uh, meant by intra filing? Do we need to fill in the 485 form and also the fees and everything has to be sent to USCIS, uh, putting our previously filed whatever we are filing now that 485 receipt and everything and asking them to port uh, the current application whatever is pending uh, to the EB2 category. Is that what that we have to pay the complete fees and the same forms and everything? Is that called intra filing or we have to withdraw the current application and refile and ask the intra-filing? It, it, certain circumstances require one and certain circumstances might require the other. 
uh, we always try and, I guess what you're referring to, interfiling is to change visa category with a pending adjustment of status application, like what we were discussing earlier. Um, again, there are certain circumstances where it's not practical or it just uh, it's not possible in one. And, you know, most of the time, you know, we try. So to give you a good example, a lot of people did this uh, who had EB2 filing dates and then EB3 final action date became uh, current. So what people did, they already had a pending adjustment of status application and they they downgrade to EB3 and then you can, you know, update your pending adjustment of status uh, with the new visa category and then continue processing the case, Okay. Certain circumstances might come up where that's not possible. Uh, again, that's a one-on-one -on -one case specific basis to make sure we uh, address the right situation, okay? Sure, thank you so much, Lucas. Thank you, thank you. Video. thank you so much for uh, yeah. giving us the information. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Lucas, we have the three members left uh, today's session. Uh, next we go for Last phone number 3410. You can say your name and uh, you can start your question. The phone number last four digit 3410. Hi. Hi, this is uh, Sri and uh, thanks for uh, giving this opportunity to ask a question. Hi, Lucas. I have a question Hi, like, uh, is it mandatory to... Hi. Is it mandatory to extend EAD uh, once we get uh, GC EAD? Is it mandatory to extend every year, even though if I want to work on H1? No, it's not mandatory. You can choose uh, whether or not to renew. Uh, as long as you have a um, the receipt notice for the adjustment of status, if you want to skip a year or two and then you want to you know refile in the future, you can do so. There's no requirement in, in absolutely filing every year okay continuously i don't need to extend it and i can i can stop extending it two three years and again i can file for extension and one more thing like uh, uh, what happens if i if we have to file only 90 days before the ead expiry right we have to renew it every year if i am in a project and uh, will they allow me to work uh, continue my work on the receipt or i have to wait uh, will they ask me to Take a forced vacation on receipt. No, how you that, can work. How that works. So this is different than L2 EAD, H4 EAD. Uh, there's 30 some odd categories for EAD. Okay, approximately two thirds mm -hmm. allow you to work on the receipt. One third don't allow that. You have to have card in hand. C9, which is the category for adjustment of status, allows you to work uh, on receipt. So it's good for six months after your card expires. You can work on the receipt itself. Okay. Okay, then we can work on this one. Then thanks for this clarification. And what about the advanced payroll? Can we only renew advanced payroll and not EAD? You can. That possible? It's possible. Okay. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, uh, Telugu. Yeah. Thanks for thank, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Answer. Thank you. Yeah. Have thank you day. very much. So next we go for phone number last four is it eight zero six one? Maybe you if you if you have any questions you can go for it. Last four is it eight zero six one? Hi, uh, just a quick question. Um, is it mandatory to have uh, the Zoom party? Thank you again, Lucas and uh, NR Radio. Uh, just quick question: Do we need to put all the pages of the passport, uh, uh, even for the spouse, uh, as I'm in the main applicant, and my spouse's uh, passport is with the Indian Embassy for the renewal, and uh, these things came up, uh, the the dates become <coughs> current, mm. uh, so it's mandatory to have all the pages. It's not mandatory. You'd want all pages, obviously, that have been stamped, uh, or you know whatever you might have uh, when. So her visa is being renewed at the moment, and you just have photocopy of the previous visa or your passport? Uh, the passport, I have it, but I think the previous copies were, like, taken two years ago or something. Uh, yeah. So if, I, if 
that's okay, then I can put all of them, but it may not necessarily have all the stamps in that uh, the copy what I have because I didn't expect it, this date move and I send my uh, my wife's passport to embassy and it's pending with them. That's I fine. have the Just, visa copy, yes. Uh, yeah. That, that's fine. Don't worry so much about that. Um, uh, one key, um, you know, item that you need to also include is the I-94. So, you know, as long as you have that, uh, obviously, the visa stamp would help. You need to reference the visa uh, document number on the adjustment of status application. Mm -hmm. So, if you can list that, that's fine. If, if for whatever reason that's that's not available, um, you know, I don't think it would be fatal to your application. But obviously, if you have it, you always want to include it. Yep, I, I have uh, that information, except the just the all the copies, latest to copies of the passport. But otherwise, I have the visas and the I-94, all the details. So. Sounds good. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Okay. Thank you for and calling. I, just, I, think, I, think just one, uh, I think I'm good. I think I'll let the let the other people ask the question. But thank you again. Yes. Yeah. And tell uh, you. Uh, thank you, Luca. Yeah, you can you oh, can uh, tune every Wednesday. We are we are continuing every Wednesday. So if you have any other questions, you can Honestly. tune and you can ask more questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Next question we go we, we go for a big help. Thank you. Yeah, we are trying to. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So we are going to next take a call. Is a Palasa R the four one two three last four digit number? Hi. Uh, yeah, this is Ravindra. Uh, my question is regarding the downgrading option. So I have two EB2s, uh, 140 filed from my current employer, and I do have one more uh, from other company as a future employer. Okay, so right now my current company is not recommending to downgrade my 140. So can, I would like to go ahead with my other 140, which is an EB2, uh, filed as a future employee, so I I need to check. I need to know the is there any implications if you file the <laughs> downgrading from the future employer. Maybe yeah, before that one, maybe Lucas. What is the priority date you was? Yeah, um, both are in. Uh, one is in uh, April fourth. One is in April seventh, <laughs> twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen April. Okay. So what I would rec what I would recommend is uh, if you're looking at employer A, the the one that first filed and that you, you're not working with right now, uh, just make sure if mm -hmm. that they're a large enough company that so let's say you're in 2014 your prevailing wage was 70k. Okay, so they're going to have to show that they have assets or profits that meet or exceed 70k. So they can show that they have the ability to pay the proffered wage whenever they file the I-140. Because you don't want to downgrade, file I-140, and concurrently file adjustment of status just to have RFE and eventually denial of I-140, which would also automatically mean that your uh, 485 is going to be denied as well. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, yes. No, so if, it's, okay. if, you're, if you work okay. with consultancy companies... How, you, you need to ask, you know, how many people are actually going to be downgrading that aren't necessarily working here? You know, there's some people that might have uh, 20 people coming back to their company. And they're going to downgrade all 20 people. So if you can imagine, let's say the prevailing wage was 70K times 20, right? So that's what? One, uh, that 1, 400,000, right? So you, they have yeah. to show profit or have assets of one million four hundred thousand to meet that uh, ability. So you don't want to have a company that only has eight hundred k on their taxes, and then try and do this for so many people. Okay, because some some owners might become aggressive and trying to say, "Oh, I'll do this for everyone." You you know what I mean? Uh, and you don't want to waste time and money in that scenario. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for call. So we have a, okay, thank you. another list. Uh, okay, thank, so, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So next we go for Rajendra. The last four is at eight double seven double six. If you have question, maybe you can go for next. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, I have just one question. Actually, this this is, all this is only useful for people who have the priority date by before Jan twentieth, right? Twenty fifteen, correct? No, before Jan first, twenty fifteen. Right. Okay. Okay. And uh, so Lucas, Jan first, yeah. it means it will include the January first or though it means until December thirty. December thirty first. Thirty first. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So next we can go for the prime, Padmaraj. The prime, do you have any question? Okay, no problem. So we can go for the last call is a uh, last four is it six five four two? If you have any questions, maybe you can. Ask. Hello. Hello. I think uh, they are connected, but uh, they don't have any questions. Uh, that's good. So the Lucas uh, today is a, is a wonderful session. We got a lot of can questions go and very valuable. Yes. Your your name, Sir, please. Can I go ahead? Same. My name is uh, Vera. Uh, Kiran Santosh. Uh, Kiran Santosh and uh, the last four are nine one three one. Nine one. Nine one three one. Okay. Are the last four digits. Oh. Yeah. I okay. I in fact okay. typed a yeah I in fact typed a question. I'll just uh, read it out quickly. Uh, so thank you, Lucas, uh, for taking the call. And uh, okay. I have uh, my situation uh, like this. I have a like I one forty uh, EB two. Uh, with uh, Jan uh, 2011, and my previous employer sold the company to a new company, mm -hmm. who is my current employer. And my attorney said, all I need is asset purchase uh, agreement in lieu of uh, name change amendment. I guess that is true, and it is coming from my lawyer. But I just want to double check with the uh, lawyer Lucas here. So that is the reason why I typed it. And maybe somebody uh, is in the same boat. So I just want to help them as well. Yeah, we actually just discussed this probably 20 minutes ago, but yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and repeat. So there's a certain memorandum that allows uh, you know, this certain circumstance to, to happen. What you need to show is asset purchase agreements or, you know, any documents mm -hmm. filed with Secretary of State showing ownership change. Um, and, and obviously, you listen to the attorney you're working with, but they'll want to make sure that all those documents right. uh, are correct. And you're not downgrading, so right. to speak. So. Uh, no, no, they, no. Basically, you just you're for the supplement J. You're just going to be uh, submitting some of those documents, probably. Uh, also, with mm -hmm. I, I would submit the memorandum itself, just to, so USCIS officer can reference that. And, but mm -hmm. right, and in recent times, I mean, I got my H one B extension uh, with that uh, I one forty. So I think I should be okay. Uh, well, so even if the company was bankrupt or out of business, it, just because you have a an approved I one forty allows you to extend over the six year period. Doesn't doesn't mean anything other than it permits you to extend beyond six years. Um, the changing of the petitioner itself is key because um, if the petitioner changes drastically, uh, the they might the proper position might not technically exist in the same capacity as it was when it when it was filed so again i probably reference the attorney okay. and work with them to make sure we get everything covered on that sure perfect okay sounds good thank you thanks thanks kiran thanks for call uh lucas i think uh, we okay, are 70 minutes fast fast to uh, one hour but can we take one more call lucas, sure or? sure not a problem okay yeah can go for Yes. Yeah, uh, this is Nitin here. Uh, I have downgrade related question. So my uh, approved I-140 from December 2011 under EB2 category. So shall I go ahead for like a downgrade to EB3 or wait for the EB2 since it's like a December 2011? But, you know, it's a good question. You're You're still, you know, a little bit of ways away from filing uh, based in EB2. Uh, I don't know if it's going to move that quickly. And like I said, when we started off the show, any opportunity to kind of get your foot in the door 
uh, and have a pending adjustment of, of status application is going to be beneficial to you. And I'll explain again why. Uh, let's say uh, the Democrats win the White House and the Senate and the House Representatives. Uh, typically, within the first 100 days of the president's term, they're going to set out their agenda and try and, and pass key legislative goals of so what he, they want to, you know, proceed on. So, if, if immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform, is on the agenda, um, even if things aren't changed so much that uh, it benefits everyone at one time, one would think that at least a uh, anyone with a pending adjustment of status application might have some benefit. And, it, and let's just say also, what if the backlog uh, is going to be fixed and, and Congress allocates 500,000 additional visas? Well, you, it, it might move, move so quick, quick it, you know, just, just having your, your hat in the ring, so to speak, would allow you to get GC much faster. So I would definitely recommend right. it. There's nothing that I, I just can't see a downside to not doing it, to be honest with you. So what if like we downgrade and what happens to the existing EB2-140 then? I mean, it's, it's there, but you're going to have to upgrade again if you wanted to utilize that date. And then what you would do is, mm -hmm. you know, but again, I, I mean, we're talking about at the current, at the current trends with the visa allocations. I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, maybe five or six years. Um, for, for each fiscal year, like 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, and EB2, there's like 25,000 cases each for India. Okay? So it's a large number mm -hmm. of people. And uh, just to get your foot in the door, I, I mean, I just would recommend it. So at that okay. time, only one I-140 will be active then? At that time for the adjustment of status, correct. And then what I would recommend is you know, do that, and hopefully within this next year, something happens with uh, Congress uh, where things are changed where you can actually get to GC, okay? Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we can take the last question, Lucas. Uh, the phone number is double eight nine seven. If you have any questions, maybe you can uh, ask, yeah. uh, otherwise we can wrap it yeah. wrap up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Hi, Lucas. I have one quick question. Uh, like, uh, I currently... Your, your name, please. Your name, please. Sorry, my name is Mark Hande. Uh, okay. Currently, my A140 is pending um, with my employer. <coughs> uh, it's actually in process. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, it's actually in AB2. Um, my, like, you know, my palm is... They just, I think it's going to expire. My recent palm is going to expire in the first week of October. Like, uh, I would like to know, like, is it possible for my employer to downgrade to EB3 uh, utilizing my old, old perm? What's your priority date? Uh, my priority date is, like, 2013. Sorry, so April the, 2013. So, your current employer is porting over a previously filed I-140, and the perm process is already completed, yeah. right? Yeah, perm process is completed, and then I have also applied for I-140 in June, like uh, three months ago. It's still pending with USCIS. Um, while, while it's pending uh, with the EU, USCIS, uh, can my employer um, file another like I-140 in EB-3 category? Uh, so you need to have a final action on... Well, you said your perm, the perm's not expired yet, right? Oh, yeah, they used it to file the um, no, uh, but pending I-140 application in EB-2 category. But your perm, has has it expired or is it still valid? Oh, it's going to expire in, I guess, 10-5, like 10-7, uh, October 7. So you can still go ahead and file, um, and you could probably uh, file in premium processing. Oh, yeah, but it looks like it, it might take a uh, while. Like, and what happens if PAM expires? Can I still use it and then file it under the EB3? So if you have a final action, like if your I-140 right now is denied and the PERM expires, you can refile. If your I-140 is approved mm -hmm. and the PERM expires, you can refile. Hmm? Okay, but it's still pending, right? But can I file EB3? But then I, I have to wait I have until to that wait. is done. If you're, I think Lucas, 
I think Lucas is. I think his uh, I one fourteen process. Maybe his question is whether in in downgraded to EB three or not utilized <laughs> to the October we submit it. We are not sure the I one forty approved in October or not. So, but his perm still valid, so you can go ahead and file again another I one forty. Okay. Is any dependency or is any okay. issues between these two? And no, my question no. is on that case, like you know, if my employer cannot file, he is unable to file it by October seventh. Like, uh, I mean, what happens in that case? Uh, like, uh, I can, I have, do I have to wait for I one forty to be like uh, approved, and then only Correct. I can downgrade? Correct. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, today, call it means already. We scheduled for the one hour, but uh, it's little over twenty four minutes. So we know that okay. the attorney's time is very valuable today. Maybe this October till October. Well, even the uh, uh, Lucas given one and a half hour time okay. to hers to clarify to our questions. Uh, Hello. Yes, so maybe I don't want to disappoint. Just I'm taking the last question and uh, ending 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 of the show. Yep, yeah. you can maybe ask question. You can ask the question. Yeah, yes, uh, go I ahead. have a question that uh, um, my priority date is uh, April two thousand fourteen in uh, EB two, mm-hmm. and uh, we are planning to get <coughs> our four eighty five filed in the EB three category to um, the same employer, like the same uh, firm. Mm-hmm. So, is there a chance if it gets rejected or uh, you know if something goes wrong? Can we fall back on the EB two, or is the petition done? Like, how does it work? You can still fall back on the EB two. Yes. Okay. So, and how long like should we expect? And um, like, how do we know whether it's approved or? Um, so, how long does it? I mean, that could take eight or nine months. You know, unless you upgrade at a later time to, um, you know, in premium processing. Uh, just to get the receipts uh, for the adjustment of status, and this is something I want everyone to be aware of, that you have to be patient. It's going to take six to seven weeks just to get the receipts for all these applications. Okay, It's a different process okay. than if you're filing H1 or I-140. They, they go to what we call a lockbox, uh, and there's different mm-hmm. processes and procedures in place, so the receipts are delayed. And, you know, again, you know, getting your... Uh, uh, EAD and advanced parole is going to at the earliest be six to seven months. Uh, so, you okay. know, it's it's a lengthy process. But um, for your I one forty question, um, after you have receipt, you can always upgrade into premium. You know, if you really wanted to know. But oh. to to be honest with you, that by the time you can currently file and do everything, um, I would just let the I one forty sit there. Uh, and then if the RFE comes up or some other query comes up, then address it at that time. And then maybe make the decision at that time to go to premium. Okay. So uh, one more question is, like, many of the uh, people from AB2 will be jumping down to EB3 right now. Correct. So how how advisable is it to, you know, come to EB3? So, so EB3... If you look at the, the, the priority dates and the year, the fiscal years where they were filed, um, it's more or less like 70,000 total cases from India uh, from, from 2009 through 2014. Now, we just said earlier, it's okay. like uh, during the same time, you had like, what, three times as many in EB2 or maybe four times. I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head exactly. But there's a lot of people. You have mm-hmm. to figure at least one third of those EB twos are going to, you know, migrate down to EB three. And the strategy is, it's right. not so much t- for you to get your GC on EB three. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing is trying to get you where you have an application for adjustment of status filed, because if there is significant action, changing immigration laws, mm-hmm. al- providing more, allocating more visas to be issued, you know, from Congress, that puts you at the front of that line so you can get it that much faster. So it's more of a strategy of what to do to, you know, get to that finish line. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you for answering. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your call. So, yes, uh, we are ending up show. Yeah, Lucas, thank you. Thank you very much. We know that you you are a very busy person these days. Uh, though given one and a four to our the listeners and viewers, and also given to the enough time to explain their question, and uh, you give me the wonderful answer to them so that everyone get clarified and uh, maybe I hope everyone get to get the more information on their questions and scenarios. Maybe they can go for the right direction and utilize the visa bulletin, October 2020 visa bulletin. So, yeah, Lucas, do you have anything apart from this closing notes or some closing notes before closing? Do you have anything else yeah. you need to say? I'd like, I'd like to add uh, one more thing. So you, you just mentioned, uh, of course, you know, it's a busy time. Uh, and, and all attorneys are going to be busy at this time. So what's really important is that you're able to feel secure in, in working with whatever attorney or whoever you're working with. Make sure that things aren't put to a last minute. Um, things, you know, if, if you provide the information and documents, it should move fairly quickly. Uh, and, you know, this is also like a probably a once in a five year uh, chance to get everything filed. So if you need uh, to file, make sure it's going it, to that the case is progressing well because uh, you know the next visa bulletin when we get notified mid October, you know maybe your date regresses and you don't want to be stuck uh, not knowing whether or not the case is going to be filed correctly or filed on time. So if you whenever you retain an attorney, make sure you have very good communication and make sure that. Um, Things are progressing. Don't wait till the last minute to hire an attorney. Uh, you know, you want to make sure you you start the process early so you can, um, you know, take full advantage of the full month. Don't wait till the last minute or you know the last week to get something started. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, session to everyone. Thank you very much. So yeah, we are closing the session. Before the closing. The, this uh, platform open to everyone to get more information and we are trying to simplify the immigration attorney from Lucas. Uh, it means a very you know, transparent information. You can tune every week uh, Wednesday Central time 6 p.m. Next, uh, we will catch on next uh, October 7th. By the time, if you have any topic, if you have any questions, you can post to Telugu Radio webpage or you can post in the Lucas uh, Burgos and Laws uh, Facebook page. Maybe you can send an email to uh, Lucas info at the red uh, bgimmlaw.com. Maybe if you have any questions, you can reach out to Lucas, get clarified, take a decision, make a step. Yeah. Utilize the October 2020 uh, Vista Bulletin. So get free time and enjoy the life. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, closing the session. We can uh, catch up next uh, October 7th, the same time, Central Times, Wednesday, 6 p.m. The tune and uh, post your question on Telugu Radio Facebook. And requesting to the do like uh, and follow the Telugu Radio Facebook. Uh, get more details and uh, updates from Telugu Radio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Signing off, Venkat.